Spying into design, uh, making a cutaway. A little bit about me. I've been in the security industry almost 20 years. I started out as a security guard, uh, moved into bodyguard work. From there, got into locksmithing. Um, I've been picking locks for about 10 years. Um, I received my basic cert for milling in lathe from Murray State College in uh, Tushomingo, Oklahoma. Um, it was a gunsmithing school. Uh, since then, I haven't touched a gun while doing machining. Um, yeah. History of cut, uh, cutaway locks. Why would anyone wreck a good lock? Um, there's various reasons. Most common one is to learn. Uh, also, curiosity. That's why I started doing it. Um, cutaways originally were used for uh, as part of the patent process. Uh, originally, um, a lot of the really early cutaways are very crude. They look like they've been done with an angle grinder or, you know, similar equipment for the era. Um, since then, they've changed a lot, and now they're very complex, and work, everyone's a work of art. Um, there's many different types of cutaways. Um, I've done cutaway latches to teach maintenance staff why locks are installed, latches are installed a certain way. Sorry guys, I've made a mistake here. Why is it down there? I don't know. Okay, is that better? <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay, so there's lots of different types of cutaways uh, from latches that I've done to teach maintenance staff how to install doors properly, how to a dead latch works, to factory cutaways, that's a medico cutaway, um, factory cutaway. It was designed just to show how the levers, how the locking mechanism worked for the shackle. Um, also I've done master lock warded cutaways uh, to help teach people how to pick them. Uh, that's where most of my cutaways end up is teaching aids. Um, another slide of cutaways. Um, yeah, here's just some more examples. Uh, this is all work I've done. Pretty much anything with a green background is a lock I've cut. Um, next slide. What, make, what makes a good cutaway? In reality, almost every lock can be made into a cutaway. Uh, what makes a good one is it's easy to take apart, so it's non-destructive to take apart. There's less work involved in the final product then. Um, what makes a bad cutaway? I haven't found a lock yet that can't be made into one with enough time and you know, care. Uh, tools. Um, you, can do, you can make a cutaway with just the hand file, and in a minute we'll have a video of that. Uh, basic hand tools, the same as to take apart a lock to rekey it. Um, plus, then you get specialized tools like mills, um, uh, slitting saws, things like that. Um, and hope, hopefully, this video works. This is a handmade cutaway. Oh. Sorry. And it's sped up a little bit just because of time. So um, it's only a two minute video. And basically I just started with a small file, um, just right at the Bible. And fairly quickly you can see I get annoyed with it. And I'll, I end up flipping the, or the file onto its side to use. Just hold on a sec, let, it, let the video catch up to me. Um, you, you can make a cutaway with just the file and device. You really don't need anything else. The more complex it gets, obviously, the more complex the tools will be to make it. And you can see there, I'm using just the, the edge of a Mel Bastard file um, to do it. it. I ended up with a nice, clean cut from it. Uh, in real time, this took eight minutes to make from, from start to finish. Uh, well, actually from start to final assembly. Um, there really wasn't a lot of cleanup to it. Uh, again, the simpler was the lock, the simpler it is to make a cutaway. 
but I just want to demonstrate that you don't need an expensive mill, you don't need thousands of dollars in tooling to make a cutaway to teach someone how to pick. And you also you don't need to spend hundreds and hundreds of dollars buying cutaway sets. So there's the final product. You, you don't see the shear line at the bottom there. there. Um, that's just because of the way, it, just the easiest way to make it. I just want to, again, to have a demonstration to show that it was possible. And next slide. Sorry, I missed this slide. Sorry about that. Um, okay. I completely. Sorry, my slides appear to be messed up slightly. Um, so, working with the mail. It's this was just a quick make a walk. I did a while ago. If any of you guys follow me on YouTube, you've probably seen this video already. Um, a walk like this, it's an American 1100 clone. It's fairly easy to take apart. I like these locks for the most part. There's a few minor things, but they're fixing them. It's a new company. They've only been in business less than a year. Um, um, yeah, so. This video is only a couple minutes again. Uh, don't worry, these are the only two videos in the whole presentation. The rest of it's more talking. Um, I should have edited it, it down just a little bit more. At least the disassembly part. So again, it's basically it's an 1100 clone, so I'm pretty sure everyone here knows how to take one apart. Um, when I mill a lock like this, I normally start one in two play, one of two places. I start with the lock body itself or the core. Um, and there's and the core is broken down into two parts: um, the Bible and the plug. Now here we have the lock body being milled. Uh, I do everything with a manual mill. It's all done by hand. Um, so. Any measurement that's done is done with a micrometer. I really don't use measuring tools that often when I do it. 99% of the time, I'm doing it just by eye. And that's just from experience. Um, Uh, for this style lock, I use a three flute, uh, one eighth inch uh, carbide end mill. Uh, the reason why I use carbide is it's nice and sharp, it gives you nice clean cuts. You don't end up with a lot of tooling marks afterwards, so there's less final cleanup on the product. Uh, and because of how sharp they are, uh, I don't have to worry about material. I can mill brass, stainless steel, um, aluminum, all with the same tool. So it minimizes my tooling, uh, my my tooling and my setup time. Um, the only tricky part with this lock, and you just saw real quick there, my calipers is when you cut across. If you cut too far off the center of where the ball bearings are, sometimes they'll fall out, or they'll jam in the lock, and then you have to start all over again. Uh, on average, I probably destroy about one in every 30 to 50 locks that I cut, which isn't 2% failure rate isn't much to complain about. The, uh, I've been asked before why I don't use oil, cutting oil while I'm doing it. I find all it does is, especially with, uh, with this style lock, uh, most brass and aluminum, you don't need oil. All it does is gum up everything and make cleanup harder and uh, make what you're doing harder. You see there, I dropped the, he the head of the mill for a little bit. When I was doing my cuts across, it wasn't quite cutting enough. 
And the whole time I'm cutting a lock, I'm constantly looking at it while it's cutting, just trying to, to the best of my ability to make sure I don't wreck it because a lot of times I'm doing locks for people like you guys. It's someone will send me a lock and go, yeah, I want this made into a cutaway. And so I only have one chance at it. I wish I could speed this up just a little bit more. Um, but this is this video is basically in real time, for the most part. Mo it hasn't been sped up. This is how fast I actually cut them. Uh, this lock in particular, because it's a nickel-plated brass lock, it cuts really, really nice and really easily. And then I sped this part up because no one wants to watch a chamfering tool go around a lock a bunch of times. So sorry about the stuttering in the video. Uh, again, it's I just like breaking the edges so there isn't a sharp edge. Uh, a lot of my cutaways end up at maker fairs and tool meetings and other lock sport events, and I don't want anyone getting cut from it. It's, it has happened. And for while well, I'm cutting the lock body, I'm, my mill's running at approximately 2,000 RPM. Um, that's as fast as my mill will go. Um, so yeah, it's a little mill. Uh, and this is the Bible. Um, and if you notice, oh, but, <sighs> won't let me go back. Uh, won't let me speed forward. We'll just we'll just skip to the next fixture. Sorry about that. Um, what I was going to say is. Uh, I use a lot of fixtures in my locks to hold things, uh, they're also called jigs. They're your best friend when you're doing repeatable work. When you want to do 10 of something, the 20 minutes, half an hour I'll take to make a fixture, you'll more than save double that time. Uh, they make just holding things easier, it's easier to get yeah, your parts square. Uh, they're just, they're great. Um, Holding interchangeable cores, it's, this is a little sled I made just for holding them. Uh, when I cut these locks, I actually cut them all as one part for uh, interchangeable cores. I just pull the pins and the springs out of it. Uh, the locks have really tight tolerances and normally the back end of them is peened in such a way that you can't get them apart without destroying them. So, for uh, key knob cylinders, I use uh, 3D printed plastic V blocks I designed. Um, ABS plastic, I print them solid. It, it's rigid enough to hold the lock in the vise so it doesn't shift under load while it's cutting. They're cheap. If you make a mistake and you drill through and you cut through one, it doesn't matter. It's, they take about 10 minutes to print on a 3D printer. And American lock, same thing, similar core. Uh, for lock bodies, there's two ways. Uh, you can, if you're just cutting one side, you can just lay it in your vise and it, it just works. If you're cutting through the lock, like you want to cut both sides of the lock, then you have to use parallels or some way to hold it up off your vise so you don't cut the vise. The one thing I hate cutting is the core plug. I haven't found a good way of holding them in my mill. So basically I use a key uh, that fits the lock and I leave it in while I cut it. So for every lock that I cut the plug in that's awkwardly shaped, I have a spare key that's been all cut up in the mill just to keep it from twisting while it's milling because there's quite a bit of force on this side that's being cut. Um, wow. Somehow, a whole bunch of slides disappeared. Um, sorry about that. Um, expect to fail when you're making a cutaway. Um, that only be 13 minutes. Um, yeah, you'll you'll break a lot of end mills. All those end mills was from one batch of 20 locks that I uh, and they just failed. Um, when you're buying end mills, cheap isn't good. 
general, but the most expensive end mill you can find in the size you want isn't necessary either. We're not working with really tough materials. Um, brass is fairly soft, aluminum is fairly soft. When you get into the steels, you end up using a lot of things like boring bars, um, mortar cylinders to get the nice swoop like you see on um, Medeco cutaways, like the factory cutaways. Um, again, I started with the lock body. If anyone has any questions at any time, just raise your hand or shout them out. I don't care. Was that one mine? Um, <laughs> I think so, actually. Uh, it was one of the first Lockwoods I ever did. Um, who else had a question? Are you pulling the cores before you do this? Pardon? Are you pulling the cores out of this? Yes. Uh, when I'm just doing the lock body. Oh, sorry. Am I pulling the cores out of the locks? Yes. Before I start milling the body, I pull the shackle and all the parts out of it, so it's just the lock body itself. Again, uh, again, this one I'm using uh, one eighth four fluke end mill uh, carbide end mill, uh, running at about fifteen hundred RPM. Yep. Yeah. Yes. I, uh, before I cut anything, I take all pins, all spring. I break them down as far as I can without destroying it. So, like with uh, small format interchangeable cores, the only reason why I keep them together is because to take them apart, you can't get them back together nicely, and the the look is just it's they just look messy. <clears throat> How do I like uh, Australian locks compared to Canadian and American? I love the brass lock wood uses. It cuts really clean. A lot of uh, master locks, they're rekeyable locks. They put an abrasive in the metal and it dulls end mills really quick and you end up with a really rough or uh, yeah, rough is the best way to describe a look to it, and it's because there's actual grit in it, because they're trying to stop people from drilling into them. Um, yes? When you're using calipers over there, um, wouldn't it be easy to just drill on it or use templates? Uh, I do a combination of both. Sorry, uh, let me repeat that for the cameras. Um, I use calipers um, for measuring and um, for me, it's just that's the way I was taught how to machine. Um, at the college I uh, taught at, they were really big on using measuring instruments for everything. But later on, once I got home and started exper and experimenting, I found that drawing on them works really well. And I use it just as a rough outline. But yeah, it's, it's really, it gets, it's down to personal preference when doing it. It's however you've been taught, whatever you're comfortable with. Uh, and in this video, you can see I'm using one of those uh, V-block to hold it. Uh, the lock, or uh, the uh, Bible of the lock. Um, and again, I'm just, I do this, all by, this part all by eye. So I'm just looking at it and I'll touch off just lightly with the end mill just to put a little shine on it to make sure it's where I want it to go. And then I cut. And you know, my shop's about the size of most uh, linen cupboards. It's about six feet by eight feet. It's a closet in my basement. It's, that's all my wife would let me have for space. So I make do with what I got. Um, I don't have a lathe right now, or I'd be doing a lot more security pins and things like that. Yep. Uh, so, uh, I actually use a. Sh um, yes, uh, can I use a shop vac? Yeah, I do use a shop vac I, uh, for cleaning afterwards. Sometimes in the middle of doing a locker at each step, I'll vacuum up real quick. I just use a shop vac with a drywall dust bag in it so I don't end up sucking brass dust into the motor because that will end your shop vac really quick and that gets expensive really quick. I've killed two in a year. Uh, in the last three years, it was, my, yeah, it was three years ago, I killed two of them in one year. Uh, with just using the standard mesh that most shop facts have. 
Um, this one, uh, when you're clamping uh, the keyway portion, uh, you're using, you have to use a lot of force because it's round. It wants to spin. Um, Do you have a key in that one? Uh, no, no, I don't have a key in this one while I'm cutting it. That was the only key I had for it. So I didn't have another key with that keyway at that time. So I didn't want to destroy the key making it. And sorry about the blurriness. It's, um, Is there any reason why well, you uh, have um, I don't have room for an air compressor. <laughs> If you, I've seen um, on some CNC machines they'll have something that fits onto the. We don't want to watch this stuff. Onto the shaft. Yeah. Um, I don't have that set up. Uh, for mine, I don't even. Would it work? It would be better with it. To go back. I got it. Okay, um, let's see, here's a key mark mortise cylinder I did for Jeff on key, uh, keypicking.com and this is full mortise cylinder with a boring bar in a boring head. It sped up really, really quick because to do, do this it took me two and a half hours because you're cutting almost, I think it's like a quarter of a mil at a time, you're shaving down. Uh, if, to do more than that with the key mark cylinder because it's made of a stronger material, I, I was breaking boring bars. That's more expensive than breaking end mills. Do you have to wait for it to cool down before you put back together? Do I have to wait for it to cool down? No. It's, uh, in this case, uh, it was, fairly cool to the touch right away. Sometimes they do get hot when you're milling steel, like I did just a random mortise for someone right before I left. And just because of the material used, there was a lot more friction. I ended up using oil for it, which makes is really messy in a six by eight shot. Is it a, is it a, is it a material? Yeah. Uh, sorry. Uh, sorry. Uh, yes, the, uh, does the material expand or contract? Yes, it does. Um, like all metals, do you want to fix that? Sorry. Uh, like all metals, as it warms up, it expands. Uh, as it contracts, you start having issues where things don't line up the same as they did or originally. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That was a really fun lock to pick. No, that one's not mine. No, that's someone else's key mark. No, actually, it is pretty close to it. Key marks have a really crazy keyway on them. They're really hard to get in North America. That one's done, it was only 18 minutes. Um, yeah. Um, uh, here's the Master Lock Series Pro Series. This is a recuable uh, lock by Master Lock. Um, it's just flying because of how quick the uh, video speed, but this lock, these locks are such a pain because there's something they put in the metal. It dulls your end mills really quick. It gums up end mills. Um, they're just not fun to do. It's a, I do them on request, but that's about it. It isn't like a lock wood that I would, I love cutting lock woods. Uh, they're a joy to work with. The tolerance is nice and tight in them. Again, I'm not using a key in this one. This is before I realized that using a key to keep your cylinder from spinning is a good idea. I lost a bunch of locks that way. Where, and I didn't realize at first what was happening. And I would take it off the mill, go to assemble it. And it just didn't look right to me. What speed did you use for that one? That one, uh, for what speed for cutting it? Or uh, again, uh, with master locks, it's around 1,000 RPM. I find if it's warmer, uh, if you cut faster than that, the lock body, actually, the material actually starts to melt and uh, sticks to the, mill, to the end mill. Yes? Have you ever cut open a laminated padlock and turned one of those into a cutaway? 
have I ever cut open a laminated padlock? I've done warded locks. I haven't done like a master number three. Um, I've looked at it. I started to do one. Uh, my biggest issue with it was getting it back together because the only way to take a laminate lock apart is to grind the posts and then you end up bending plates. It's really hard to get them uh, for everything to get back together and look close to factory. Um, let's see if we have something else here. Uh, I did a safe mount for a chub, I believe this was for a chub safe for a guy and this is just showing the final product and I used a piece of uh, uh, U-channel aluminum. That, it was an end cut that I got from my, metal from my nearest metal shop and all I ended up doing is uh, drilling all the mounting holes and tapping everything for him. Um, This lock is cool. Um, this is a sergeant. This is a non rekeyable lock, but it, was, it came sub-assembled. So you know when you, buy, when you buy a brass body padlock and there's no way to take it apart? Uh, sergeant used to sell them sub-assembled where you could pin them, the locksmith would pin them, and then pin uh, all the chambers closed. Uh, they're really hard to find now in North America. I was lucky to find two. So uh, with this one, I just started out with an end mill and I just did my profile. You saw there was Sharpie mark, or sharp marker lines all over and that was just a rough idea of what I wanted to do with it. And then I just slowly stepped it down about half a mil each cut, half a mil to a mil until I finally hit the pin chambers and then that's where I stopped. And you can see there where the core body is. Has there ever been a lock that I've done that I won't go back to? So far, uh, that's my feeling on the Apple Disc Lock Pro series. I've done a bunch of them. They, they look good. It's just to cut the plug around the outside uh, and disassembling it. I just don't lock out all the time. And sometimes they, I'll have the plate fall through and it just won't hold together anymore. Um, I, would do, I would probably do one again if someone asked, nice. Um, but I'll, I'll cut any lock, I'll give it a shot. It's, I, I like risk. A little bit of stress is never a bad thing when it comes to that. It's sometimes I'll spend hours researching a lock before I even take it apart. It's I'll go through patent drawings and try to understand the mechanism behind it just so when I go to cut it, I'm not wrecking it in the process. And this one, I'm using compressed air uh, to help clear away chips just because it's a solid body lock. What's the hardest lock you ever came across and what's the current lock that you're most dreading to actually have to do? Uh, the hardest lock I've come across and the one I'm most dreading to do. Um, uh, the new Bowley uh, padlock is the one I'm dreading the most. but. As soon as I have the money, I'm going to be ordering a couple. As soon as the kickstart's done, um, the, the hardest one though has been the Bowley uh, mortise cylinder, and it's just the way they designed it. It's a great lock. I love it, but to cut it, it's it's just difficult. It's the way there's parts inside, parts inside, parts, and and they slide and interact. It's hard to get everything to line up just right at the end of the day. Um, I would do one again. I'm actually probably going to be doing one when I get back home. I still have one I owe someone. Uh, yes, uh, I use a bull nose end mill sometimes for chamfering. Um, it's, I, I, like the, I like the swoop of it, the look of it once it's done. Um, so far everyone that I've talked to or who's seen them likes it too. It depends on the lock. It, sometimes I just want to do something different. 
And again, I just took, an, I just took a two millimeter end mill and just went through and cleared out each pin chamber. It's almost done. And then after milling, that's the final product. Um, Do you do much to it once you, like, when you clean it up, or do you just, like, get it? Honestly, uh, my deburring is minimal. It's because I try to always use sharp end mills while doing it. Um, so then that way I have less cleanup to do later on. Uh, I don't like filing things. I don't like polishing things that much if I don't have to. Um, so, yeah. Um, we'll throw on one more video. Back. Sorry. I don't do slides very often. Um, so yeah, this is my YouTube channel, Anarchy One. It's a zero, not an O. So if you go looking for the channel, it's W zero N. Um, uh, also, can you um, flicker? Flicker. Uh, no, not flicker. Twitter. Uh, you put uh, photos up somewhere else, don't you? Um, I. Uh, I put photos up generally on keypicking.com and lockpicking101. I've been a member of both forums for four to five years. Um, there's the guys on those forums were the ones that really pushed for me to start making cutaways. So you, you're, you're not on Flickr then? No. That means all this stuff on Flickr are for people who sent you stuff and are putting it on Flickr. Then. Really? I didn't know I would, that I had stuff on Flickr, to be honest with you. Um, I'm on Instagram. I'm on Twitter. Those are the two big ones in Canada uh, for social media. I don't do Facebook anymore. I do have a Facebook account. If you, can, if you know my whole name, you'll be able to find it quite easily. It's pretty much private, though. Um, let's see if I have an interchangeable core here. So you can see I've been doing cut YouTube videos for three years. Uh, Sergeant in Greenleaf and Viral Walk, that was just... That was never actually supposed to be a public video. That was, I did that lock for someone and they wanted a video of it then, but they just kept sending the video link to other people, so I made it public. Um, uh, Master lock, this was a lock from a school uh, locker room, or like locker lock, uh, that I ended up actually uh, making for Dark Sim 905. Um, from Twitter, I'm sure most of you have at least seen him. He's pretty big into Locksport, uh, and he just asked me if I could do it, and I said, why not? It's a very simple uh, master dial lock. Uh, they have a keyway on the front of them. The keyway does not open the lock. People think that, and they go to pick it. As soon as you pick that keyway and turn the dial, you've reset the code to a new code. They, they all have 10 codes in them from the factory, and at the end of the school year, they push a button on the back, set and turn a key on the front, and change the code for the next year, so students can't get into the locker they had last year. Um, this one has ended up uh, in Tool, New Jersey, I believe. It's part of their collection. And again, all I did is, it's a steel body, so I just went with an end mill and just cut away what I thought would be okay. And I just kept going until I ran it until everything was cut. Did some pockets and windows on the side. Yes? So you said they, they come with team combinations from the factory and then you can advance through that. When you get to the end, do they have to replace a lock or does it cycle back to the start? Uh, general, uh, when these locks, when they, uh, they go through all 10 of them, they generally replace them. It's once every 10 years yeah, then, yeah. so, or 10 school year. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, is there any other questions? Uh, I am doing a workshop after this. So if you want to come and make cutaways, I'm better that way than speaking. So if you have any questions, I'll be in the back workshop area where uh, Mick the Pick has, his, has the showcase. 
uh, and we'll be cutting some Lockwood locks. And, and if there's no other questions, thank you.